Welcome everyone to our panel discussion. Today we're going to be talking about training in resuscitation. We have a number of folks joining us for this conversation and I'm going to go ahead and give everyone an opportunity to introduce themselves. Starting with our colleagues from, from Foam Frat uh, up in the corner, Justin and, and Sam. Tell us a little bit about what you do, where you are. So I'm Tyler and Sam, not Justin and Sam. Come on, man. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I'm right next to jo well, Justin's up there in the corner. Yeah, I'm Tyler. This is Sam. We're from uh, Foam Frat. We do an educational blog and podcast for EMS and nursing, and we're happy to be here, man. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you. And tell us a little bit about your backgrounds clinically. So I work as a flight medic up at a Lifelink 3 in Minneapolis, and I work out of a couple of the different bases. I just switched to the the, the base out of the cities in Anoka. And uh, Sam, you work yeah. ground critical care in Milwaukee. Outside of Milwaukee. Yeah. Just outside of Milwaukee. Okay, excellent. John Todaro. Hi, John Tadaro. I'm the director of Eagle Emergency Education Consultants, a consultant firm that specializes in EMS education and the use of simulation. Um, and I've been a medic about 45 years. And as the panel knows, my claim to fame is having been Nick's partner in the early 70s or late 70s, rather. Very good. Thanks for being here, John. And Justin Herzler. Hi, everybody. I'm Justin Herzler. I'm a EMS clinical support specialist for Zoll Medical, which means that we go out in the field and do clinical support for agencies all around the country in North America. Previous to this, I was a 911 medic uh, here in Central Texas for almost a decade, as well as a clinical instructor and QA QI officer, and was also a tactical medic traveling all over working with various agencies. So happy to be here. This is a, a very passionate subject of mine. Glad to be with you guys. Terrific. And Rom. Hi, my name is Rom Duckworth. Uh, I've been a firefighter and paramedic for just over 30 years now, uh, centrally based out of Ridgefield Fire Department in Ridgefield, Connecticut, about an hour outside of New York City, uh, with a clinical background in commercial, private, hospital-based EMS. And I'm our department's paramedic EMS coordinator. Very good. And Tom. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Boothley, Battalion Chief of EMS for Hilton Head Island Fire Rescue and Resuscitation Enthusiast. Very good. And Justin. Everyone, Justin Shore coming to you from the San Francisco Bay Area. I've been in the fire service 26 years, the last 10 as a paramedic supervisor for a uh, very large, very big, very busy uh, EMS agency there. Very good. And Dr. Holly. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Joe Holly. I am an EMS uh, physician based in Memphis, Tennessee, and the medical director for uh, Memphis Fire Department and several surrounding departments, as well as the state of Tennessee, and a longtime uh, resuscitation and research enthusiast. Excellent. So happy to have all of you here for today's conversation. Something that uh, I share your passions for is training, particularly in resuscitation. Uh, early in my career, I was also involved with uh, a lot of laboratory resuscitation research, which is where I kind of got the uh, bit by the uh, academic medicine bug. So with that, let's talk a little bit about how our respective agencies approach training. And let me start out uh, with uh, Tyler and Sam. Uh, Tyler specifically, let's, let's start with you. Talk a little bit about how your department goes about training and resuscitation. Do they uh, do mostly classroom, uh, simulators, online? You know, how, how does your department try to approach this challenge of resuscitation training? Yeah, it's a great question. So it's interesting because when you say resuscitation, everybody assumes you're talking about cardiac arrest, right? That's how we, we primarily associate the word resuscitation with cardiac arrest. But in reality, that's not the case. I mean, a lot of times you're resuscitating a patient to avoid cardiac arrest. And so I work for a program called Lifelink 3 out of Minneapolis. I mean, a top-notch hem service. And we do quarterly simulation. And the simulation is designed to help you try to identify the spots where you say, hey, I think this patient may code, or I think this patient is, is going downhill. And what's interesting about that is we're, only, we're one of the only helicopter programs to carry a mechanical CPR device on the actual helicopter. And so a lot of being prepared is knowing when to anticipate that patient may go into cardiac arrest. 
And so the way our aircraft is set up, we fly a Augusta 119. Uh, our mechanical CPR device is behind the forward facing seat. And if the patient were to go into cardiac arrest while you're flying, you have to pull it out, get it out, put the back, you know, all the stuff that goes into it. And we have to try to anticipate which patients maybe should we uh, start to prepare or get the uh, get it opened up. And, you know, I'm not going to name any particular uh, brands, but uh, some of them some of them involve setting them up a little bit before you can deploy them. And so that's something we're t we're trained on is what are some of the things we should anticipate? And there's always going to be the patients that you have no idea that they're going to go into cardiac arrest and all of a sudden, boom, they're in cardiac arrest. Um, but we do these quarterly simulations that are done with uh, high fidelity mannequins. We do the human performance simulation. And it's really, really interesting to see how the different clinicians gestalt and their um, their Bayesian priors prime them to get ready for cardiac arrest. So that way they're better prepared for it. So we do it in the, uh, in the form of simulation. Uh, we got a lot of really smart people turning the uh, the wheels behind the scenes and preparing our clinicians for that. Excellent. Well, I see a lot of head nodding from John because that's kind of <laughs> his thing. Uh, but uh, Sam, how do how do they approach it uh, on the uh, west side of Milwaukee? <laughs> uh, I can say similar things to what Tyler is saying right now, but I think that maybe it'd be better to note something that we've been working on a little bit, which is resuscitation prior to intubation or advanced airway uh, preparation. And so something that Tyler and I have been working on specifically is not focusing so much. So we've been working on an advanced airway class. And so I want to talk a little bit about something very similar to what Tyler was focusing on, which is some of those um, clinical gestalts that go into figuring out when is this patient actually going to code? Because we see things like, um, you know, we see, we talk about these very advanced procedures and we all want to be able to intubate. We all want first pass success and things like that. But what did it take to get that first pass success? Was it the patient desaturating down to zero or was it that patient, their systolic blood pressure, you can't even shock read it. index, yeah. shock index. And was it that patient systolic blood pressure going down to something somewhere where you can't even read it before. So kind of complimenting what Tyler was talking about, ta focusing on programs like that where you think about how you know, there's that famous saying an, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure right and so focusing training on where is this patient actually going where is the trajectory actually headed and i think that's where training has to go and so we've been working on programs like that and that's something that we've been working on locally as well is just figuring out with some of those advanced procedures with some of the the monitoring equipment that we have where is that patient's actual trajectory headed? And how can, you, uh, how can you head off that trajectory with simple procedures and going back to really the basics of, are we actually watching those vital signs? Are we actually watching how this patient is trending? And how can we quickly intervene on that to change the trajectory of that patient? So Tyler said it best, but yeah, cause that's something that we're working on as well. Once you get into the resuscitation process, if we're talking about cardiac arrest, um, there, you, you kind of know what you got to do. You know, there's, there's, there's very, there's guidelines for it and there's ACLS guidelines and, you know, some, some organizations may vary a little bit. I know uh, we've changed our dosing of epi. We do epi every 10 minutes instead of every three to five minutes. But it's very interesting because I remember a, when I was going through paramedic school, somebody said patients don't rapidly deteriorate. Clinicians just all of a sudden notice or rapidly notice or something like that. And that's so true. And it's all based on what you've seen in the past and your recognition, prime decision making. And you may say, "Ooh, I see that end title CO2 dropping. I see this. This patient's probably going to go into cardiac arrest. And then you start the wheels turning. So that's that's I don't know. I'll start. I'll start. Stop, stop talking now. Assessment but, uh, and monitoring. Assessment and yeah, monitoring. Well, said, that's kind of where our <laughs> brains are headed right now with both training and, and monitoring and where we feel like that that has to head because there's a lot of like brilliant minds out there when it comes to the resuscitation during cardiac arrest. But we want to focus on like, for instance, like when we train advanced airway or something. Yes, yeah, it's, it's really awesome. Like, like I said, get that first pass success. But what was the cost of it? Right. Was the cost right. of desaturation or a hypotension? And so that's what we've been trying to focus on is, is trying to figure out that trajectory. And then how can you you create an impasse between that? So, OK. 
So, John, given that training is really kind of the center of your professional life, uh, what's your sense of how a lot of the agencies uh, that you've worked with in the Central Florida area in particular, uh, how they're approaching resuscitation training? Are they doing a lot of simulation? Are they still doing, uh, you know, directed readings? You know, how, yeah. how are they typically approaching it? Because I'm trying to get sort of a baseline, if you will, on where things are, and then we'll talk a little bit about where they need to go. It's, it's sort of 50-50. I would say a, good, a fair amount of services are starting to look at uh, and using simulation in various stages, whether it's low fidelity, medium fidelity, high fidelity. Um, they're partnering with, with schools who have programs that they can use and that sort of thing. Uh, unfortunately, we see a lot of departments who are, who are kind of stuck in the 90s mentality of there has to be a, you know, a, an instructor in the room standing in front of a board flipping through the 700th PowerPoint slide uh, and giving a, giving a lecture versus uh, an educational process. Uh, and, you know, PowerPoint's fine. And I'm not ditch in PowerPoint. I use it myself. But from the perspective of do we really want to teach providers how to do good assessments? Because if you can't do a good assessment, you can't go do good treatment. So, you know, doing good assessments, doing good reassessments, and how are those done to a level of competency, simulation helps with that. Simulation reinforces that. And it, it also can uh, allow an educator to put a cognitive load on the student to stress them just enough to make it seem real without crushing them. Uh, those All of us that are older remember the days of being crushed in the ACLS code and hoping that the Valium is going to be available at some point during that code for us. Um, that's not what we want. We want a cognitive load on the student that allows them to be stressed to the level where their learning capacity increases. And simulation does that extremely well, especially if it's if it's being run properly and, and you're using combinations of high fidelity and standardized patients. Uh, and uh, one thing that that um, that the guys from from uh, Foam Fret mentioned that I want to re repeat is um, redoing training in very short intervals. Uh, this process of being trained and not looking at something until it's recertification time pretty much eliminates retention. And for, for good, solid retention, you need repetitive education and repetitive skills competencies, repetitive skills assessments. Uh, and every two to three months is about the max limit on that. If you look at you know the AHA's research and some of the other research that's out there on quote unquote, resuscitative education, they talk about every two to three months being appropriate. It's really important that we understand that education not only has to be every two to three months and be fre frequent, but it has to be um, a little bit more individualized for the student. It has to be individualized for that medic that's coming off the street. What are their weak spots? And how do we know that? We know that from good quality assurance. We know that from good reviews from field training officers and from medical directors. And all of that combined creates a training mentality, an education mentality that allows a department to develop and grow their personnel. Uh, and, you know, and, and we move from the technical aspect of pre-hospital care to the clinician aspect of paramedicine. Um, and I'm going to get off my high horse now. All right. So, Rami, let me shift the question a little bit uh, as, as you respond. Opine a little bit about how your area is approaching training and what you think maybe they're doing well, uh, but significantly what they're not doing so well. Because I want to get more around the uh, idea of what does our EMS community need in terms of training uh, to kind of lead into the next part of the discussion we'll have a little bit later about how products and services and technology might scratch that itch. Sure, um, for our area, I'm in charge of training a combination of EMS responders and first responders from a variety of different agencies, law enforcement, police, EMS, both uh, career and volunteer. And combining all of that together is, certainly presents uh, a number of challenges. Um, not just because each type of agency has its own different um, background and approach to education and the students have their own expectations of what's going to be involved, 
But what I think, regardless of what type of agency and even what type of clinician, you need to have an overall plan as to how your resuscitation system of care is going to work. And it's going to involve the telecommunicators and the hospital and everybody. And that's not to say that each individual that you teach has to have a comprehensive understanding, but you need to have that plan so that you can go in and this is what we try to do. And I think that we do well to answer your question where we're building isolated skills initially, whether that's simply rock star compressions uh, and effective ventilations to um, better intubation, first pass success without doing it at all costs, um, as the guys were talking about before. Um, and being able to do that while also pulling together that whole system of care. So you were building on the, the clinical competencies and the isolated skills for individuals and then helping those individuals, usually through simulation at some level, as John was talking about, be better individual parts of the system as a whole. Um, what I think that we do is we, we do well stepping up those individual components, but like a lot of us in education, I would love more time and more resources to be able to pull all of those pieces together to really make a rock solid system. And that's what we're continuing to strive for. And, and honestly, one of the places that I use as a model is, is Tom. <laughs> We'll get to Tom in a minute. But first, we're <laughs> going to stop by Memphis, Tennessee, where I heard there's some adequate barbecue. But uh, <laughs> that being said, uh, Dr. Howick, you know, you're looking at a pretty big chessboard. I mean, you're you're looking at the whole state of Tennessee, a big metro area. Uh, you're very uh, active nationally. What's your gestalt, if you will, about what EMS is doing well in resuscitation training? and where we've really got some gaps. Well, I, I think you've heard many of the, the real key issues from the other panelists on the, on the dais today. And that's, you know, we've historically focused a lot on uh, competency-based training, skill-based training, which I think is incredibly valuable. Uh, but I think the real areas that are becoming more and more important are the integration or uh, type training where you you incorporate the skills into uh, a resuscitation, for example, of uh, whatever flavor you wish to do, so that you utilize not only the individuals and the individual uh, life sustaining or life saving skills, but the entire team uh, and uh, team management skills, as well as sort of the whole big picture from the dispatchers, uh, you know, telephone CPR quality to post resuscitation uh, stuff that might go on at the hospital. So it, it's really about taking a, a larger and larger perspective, I think. And it's also really about uh, reality. Um, and simulation has come so far in the last few years at uh, much more accurately representing what uh, providers are going to see in the field and how those patients are going to respond to interventions, that's made a huge difference. And I think that's one of the real key important parts here is you've got to train like you play. Uh, and that is exceedingly important, particularly in the cardiac arrest resuscitation space. Well, excellent. Justin Shore, I'm going to shift it a little bit on you also. We've talked a lot about simulation, uh, but what about all of the other tools, um, journal articles, vlogs and podcasts, for goodness sake, uh, you know, directed readings, uh, you know, other, other tools that are available in the training toolbox? Uh, do they have a role to play in resuscitation education? And if so, you know, what's your take on integrating those pieces together into something that gets us to where we want to be? Nick, absolutely they do. Just look at the forum that you've put together here, being able to bring in these different voices, experts in our own corners and share best practices. We used to call it stealing ideas. Now it's the sharing of best practices and adopting of best practices. Um, you really have to find the students where they are. If your students aren't thriving in the classroom, perhaps they're listening to podcasts, they're watching certain videos. Move your content into that medium and you'll get a lot of success from that. We've seen that not only with what the guys are doing at Foam Frat, but also 
look to law enforcement, fire, and military for other answers. The, we're not rebuilding the wheel here or reinventing anything. We're just taking the way that they absorb information and we're giving it what we want it to have. You know, the, the things that, that we can do successful in my system, I can't move 350 paramedics through a simulator in any reasonable time frame to get the same exposure. But what we can do, like Tom Boudelet was talking about with uh, high performance CPR, having between seven and 11 providers at the scene, and one of those providers is the overall clinical lead who can look over and see that the, the BVM isn't being done exactly the way it could and offer real time QA in the moment. And that way, everyone at the scene gets to learn on the most high fidelity simulation we have, which is an actual patient. So outside of that, Find the students where they are, get them the information in the format that they enjoy, that they can absorb, listen to on the way to and from the firehouse, and you will have better providers as a result. Absolutely. Uh, Tom, you've had a, a very successful and, and mature program in Hilton Head. Uh, how do you guys uh, approach resuscitation training in Hilton Head? And if you can comment on, you know, the, the multimedia aspects of this, how do you integrate uh, whatever the the student might be responsible individually uh, in terms of study, and then how you bring that all together with any sort of team training. Sure. Well, well, first I wanted to let you guys know something kind of interesting because it just so happens I was in the CARES registry today, and I went into their advanced analytic tools, and I printed out a list of all of our survivors since the beginning of 2011, and I counted them up. We have 78 cardiac arrest survivors on Hilton Head Island since the beginning of 2011. Two thirds of those were bystander witness shockable cardiac arrests. Um, and a, a huge number of those had no prodrome prior to their collapse. So while I, I applaud the idea of, of knowing what to look for in the peri-arrest patient and, and predict when a patient may decompensate, it, we need to appreciate that many of these patients have no prodrome and collapse uh, wherever they may be and every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results that it gets. So um, if, our, if our system is well designed, then we can save up to 50% of our uh, bystander witness shockable cardiac arrest. If not, if it's not optimized and it's left up to the individual's skill uh, or knowledge of ACLS, that save rate may be as low as say 10%. So uh, interestingly, during that same period of time, I think we've saved less than five patients or uh, rescued fewer than five people out of structure fires during that same period of time. So people love to say, well, it's such a small percentage of our call volume. That's what, how people kind of dismiss the importance of being prepared for sudden cardiac arrest. But if you look at the number of patients that we have saved from cardiac arrest versus the number that we have rescued out of structure fires, very, very asymmetrical. And yet we purchase million dollar tiller trucks and all this other infrastructure to, to, for fire suppression. So that's really important. Just wanted to say that first before I explain why we put these resources. Big, big uh, smile on uh, Dr. Holly's face there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, all that said, um, what we do is we train uh, high performance CPR the Seattle way. So we utilize the pod method and instrumented mannequins where uh, all the students uh, demonstrate mastery in rate, depth, recoil, ventilation, and perishock pause. They learn that as individuals and then they, learned, they learn it in a team-based way until they are able to swap the rescuer out on chest compressions during the perishock pause and then it really clicks and everyone's high-fiving and they're getting you know good scores on their sim pad and things like that um, but we also hit the didactic and we explain the why and the science and the why what makes a good compression why are we compressing a rate of 110 why we're using a metronome why we're compressing two inches why we're allowing full recoil why overventilation is deleterious and increases interthoracic pressure and decre decreases blood return to the heart. So they understand that conceptually and they actually watch a video of high performance CPR from the South Carolina Resuscitation Academy and it's our firefighters in our uniform doing it. And so they, they, they watch it first and then we start very basic, which is pulse check and like hover, no pulse, begin CPR. It's very modular. It, it starts the exact same way every single time, no matter what the situation is. Um, so they develop that muscle memory. 
because what I keep hearing from people that come here from around the country, from other systems, is, is like, you know what? We had pit crew CPR, but we just kind of thought that the first few minutes of a cardiac arrest is chaotic, and then it eventually settles down, and then roles and responsibilities are understood. But when they come here, they realize, no, it does not have to start out in a disorganized way. It can start out very organized, very methodical from the very beginning. And then that really builds confidence because no, how, no matter how out of control the scene is, by just taking your positions and starting with that pulse check and that hover, you're exerting your will on that situation. You're making it familiar. You've done it before. And I've heard that metronome so many times now that I can imagine it even when it's absent because we always do it that way and we're checklist driven. So uh, when the supervisor arrives on scene, okay, they've got enough room around the patient, they're doing good rate depth recoil, the, the oxygen's turned on, we've got the capnography circuit between the mask and the bag, uh, the pad placement is optimal, check, 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 check. And then once we get a pulse back, flip the card over and it's post resuscitation care we're attaching pulse oximetry we're getting a full set of vital signs where we you know we, we're capturing the 12 lead and transmitting it to the hospital uh and it, it, so it's very organized it's very methodical it's very repeatable and so i would just say um i would just encourage everybody don't think just because it's a small percentage of your call volume that it doesn't represent your greatest opportunity to return people back to their families that otherwise would have perished. And that's a big deal. And that's, uh, you know what, it, 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 now it's a part of our DNA. And so, um, and, and you know, it just makes me very proud to know that we've successfully configured our system to do that. It means that it's possible. And it means that other systems can do the same thing. Very good. Justin Herzler, I'm going to shift things a little bit to you now and kind of pose, maybe this is just an old guy question, but uh, do people read anymore? Uh, you know, we've talked about, you know, high, low, medium tech simulations, podcasts, uh, drills, et cetera. Uh, what role, if any, does, uh, you know, picking up a journal article or reading a chapter of a textbook or other things, how does that fit in with, uh, you know, the, the, the EMS workforce today? That's a really good question, Mick. Uh, speaking from my own very nerdy perspective, uh, yeah, I, I read all the time and many of my cohorts read all the time. And uh, a lot of my former coworkers also read all the time. And those that didn't, I found either A, had very short career lifespans and went on to do other things, or B, engaged in other types of media to get that information, you know, similar to what Justin was talking about. The foam frat guys know this very well as well. There's a lot of different ways to present information these days and different people have adapted to different mediums as their preferred and easiest way to absorb that information. Uh, I had a former coworker who was a, a tactical medic at the state level, and he would have to drive sometimes eight to 12 hours to get to the scene of a mission. And podcasts were his lifeblood because he can't read while he's driving, you know, but he would regularly get that information through podcasts. So I think, I think it all plays a role in there. Uh, and certainly I think that without peer reviewed literature, we're lost at sea. You know, my, my experience both in the field and in my current role is that perhaps the greatest obstacle to training in resuscitation is the very, forgive me for saying this, but it's a very low bar set for the national standard. And whether you're talking about AHA protocols or even CAS accreditation or any of those things, until we come up with a very high expectation that's applied throughout the country and agreed upon as you must be able to meet certain performance metrics, including things like CPR feedback and regular review of your post-arrest post data or any sort of resuscitation data, all of those things should be a given in these circumstances. And unfortunately, where we are in America, at least right now, they are not. Uh, and I think that's what holds us back perhaps more than anything else. Well, John Tadar, I'm gonna kind of close things up with you because we've talked about all these different learning technologies, uh, different media uh, by which the education to deliver. How does an individual student's learning style, you know, that part that's, you know, just this part of their DNA, some people, 
you know, do well with certain learning styles and, and don't do well with other learning styles. How does that factor in as you're trying to figure out as an EMS decision maker, making investments in learning technology, to what extent do you need to factor in learning styles of the individual employees in your organization? Well, uh, quite a bit. It's really important that, that uh, anyone who's looking at any technology understands it's technology. It's not the learning. It's not the education. Um, the biggest mistake people make is they get technology awe. The sales guy shows up and shows them all this fancy stuff and they go, ooh, 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 I want that stuff with the goggles that glows in the dark. Okay. What are you going to use it for? Who's going to use it in your department? Is it going to provide the education your staff really needs. Um, I'm a firm believer that you have to provide the opportunity for the student to learn at the level that they're learning, whether that's textbooks, whether that's online, podcasts, videos, live simulations, standardized patients, virtual reality. There's all kinds of new mixed realities coming out that people are going to start to learn to use for, for this uh, type of education. But you have to be really careful to not just use the technology because it's technology. We need to remember that the, the purpose of education is to provide input to improve competency. And as long as we have a plan to do that and we adapt that as much as we can to the individual learner, they will learn. All right. Some people just don't do well if you hand them a book and say, read these three chapters. We're going to talk about it on Friday. It might need to be a podcast discussion like we're doing right now or a, a panel or a group. Or maybe we have them sit down and do an, an online um, computerized version of a simulation. It, it really, in this day and age, there's so much good way ways to help students learn, we shouldn't tag them and put them in a corner and say, sit in the classroom for eight hours and I'm gonna stand here and lecture to you because you can't drill a hole, take a stick and push the information in the hole, all right? It has to be absorbed. And for students to do that, they have to want to, one, and two, it has to be in a format they understand and they're willing to do. And I, I think that's the beauty of all these choices we have now with all of the technologies, all the different medias, is we can adapt it to not only learning styles, but uh, as you pointed out, Justin Herzler, uh, the fact that they're driving a long way, they yeah. have an opportunity to learn with those uh, audio podcasts, uh, et cetera. So a lot of choices to take into consideration here as you contemplate your technology purchases related to resuscitation, like so many other topics we've talked about today, it has to be contextualized. We have to put it uh, uh, in the frame of implementation science, if you will, uh, to make sure that it really has an impact on the outcomes we're trying to achieve. So with that, we're gonna wrap up uh, this particular panel. Uh, we will be taking your questions and comments uh, in the live venue in just a moment. So uh, thanks everyone for being on this panel and uh, we'll see you in the Q&A in just a moment.